And welcome back, everyone. Now, our next guest is Saji Salam. Now, Saji's with us, been with us before, and he is the principal at Care Venture Capital. Today, we're going to be speaking with Saji regarding REITs. Now, Saji, what are REITs? Thank you for that question. Uh, REITs are basically real estate investment trust, and it's a company that essentially owns and operates or, or finances income-producing properties. Um, they are good because they generate a steady income stream for investors, but uh, offer a little way in, in the way of capital appreciation. Uh, most REITs are publicly traded like stocks, uh, which makes them very liquid. Uh, and, and REITs invest most in most real estate assets like uh, apartments, hotels, medical centers, retail centers, etc. And then pay most of the profit as dividends to the investors. Now what different, what different types of REITs are out there? Um, there, are, uh, y there are two ways of classifying the different types of REITs. One is based on how and where they invest. So there are some REITs that uh, invest in equity. So they basically own and manage uh, income producing assets. Um, so that is, uh, yeah, that, that's the equity model in, in, uh, uh, in, in REIT investment. Uh, then you have the mortgage REITs. Uh, they are lenders and who finance the uh, real estate operators through mortgages and, and loans and that's kind of what the mortgage REITs do. And then there's a third variety which is the hybrid variety which is uh, they use strategies uh, you know which is uh, wh wh whereby they invest in both equity and mortgage. So those are the two sorry the three types of uh, REITs uh, based on how or where they invest. Um, and in terms of how they are traded, there are two, three types. But the one that those which are more common are the public traded REITs. So for the public traded REITs, you can buy the shares, um, you know, on, on the national um, uh, exchanges. So they are bought and sold by individual investors. Then there are uh, the a type of REITs which are not really listed on the uh, um, stock exchange as well. So they are not publicly traded. So those are the two types, broadly two types of REITs from how they are uh, traded. Now Saji, let's talk about financial underwriting. I mean, what does that entail? Um, so basically, a couple of things that we need to look for in, in uh, financial underwriting of commercial real estate assets is of course, uh, the top line, uh, which is how much income is the property generating. Um, and then we will look at the expenses as to how much we are spending, and, uh, and then we come down to the net operating income. Um, so to, to get to here, we are typically provided a T12, or a trailing 12-month uh, P&L of, uh, of the asset. So we would look at the P&L for, for the last 12 months, and that is kind of our baseline. And in some cases, we also look at uh, the T12 from two, three years ago, just to understand how the property has been trending. Uh, but once we get a T12, uh, we look at the income, which is, hey, how much uh, rents are we collecting? How much um, other income are we collecting like pet rents, pet fees, um, late fees, um, admin, admin fees, application fees. So there's a whole bunch of other income um, that, that, is, uh, that, that will be there uh, on the uh, uh, financial statement. Um, then we look at uh, situations where we have uh, reimbursement of things like uh, water bill or electricity bill whereby the um, tenants are paying for the uh, electricity and, and water. So those are things that we would look for. Um, and then, uh, then we move on to the expenses side. So you have utilities, you have um, other expenses for maintenance. So all of those 
uh, will show up in your in your T12 and in your uh, PNL. So some of these are expenses that you can control, right? You you can uh, control some of the maintenance cost. Um, uh, you can control some of the utilities, uh, but there are un uh, there are certain items that you cannot control because that's outside of your realm. Um, so things like insurance and, and, and property taxes, these are um, provided by those appropriate vendors. And then, uh, you know, you, there's once it is negotiated, um, especially the insurance, once it is negotiated and we finalize, there isn't much we can do about that. And uh, property taxes, again, uh, this is very much dependent on the county. And uh, the most we can do is, is protest those uh, property taxes and, uh, and then the county might say that, hey, yes, this time we are able to uh, cut down on the property taxes a little bit based on your, um, your protest. Uh, but for the most part, the property taxes, insurance, once they are finalized, then there's not much room to move. Um, so those are the other expenses that you would look for. Um, and you add it all up and then you will see the uh, expenses out there. So we talked about the uh, P&L and we looked at the um, income and expenses. And so once we have these analyzed, then we come to the uh, uh, net operating income. So we look at how much the net operating income is. And, and then the key factor is uh, what is now available to, to pay the, uh, what, what is available from the net operating income to pay your debt service. So we need to have, obviously we need to have enough money uh, to pay for the debt service and then we also need to look for what we can pay the investors. Um, so those are the key pieces that we look at when we do a financial underwriting um, to, to look at the income and, and expenses and other uh, other improvements that we do, like uh, you know, capex items that are there, that is capital expenditure, uh, expenditure items. Um, uh, look at the net operating income, and then make sure that we have funds to to pay that service and uh, also pay the investors. Now, Saji, what are financing term sheets? Um, so, term sheets are the documents that your lender provides you um, to say that, hey, uh, this is your loan and these are the terms of the loan. So that's, that's the simplest uh, definition of the term sheets. They're not final yet, so this is just for, uh, for you to understand what, what's coming your way. And many a time these term sheets are negotiable. Um, so after a, a lot of back and forth on the term sheets, then we come to a final term sheet which we sign on and that is what goes into your actual loan document. Um, so let's look at uh, what are the major components of a uh, uh, term sheet. Um, so yeah, it will start with your loan amount. You, know, you want to know how much um, loan you're getting from, from the bank. Um, that will be the terms in terms of um, the interest rates. Um, and, and, and also the, the term of the loan itself, like it's, a, it's at for three years or 30 years. Um, and then uh, we talked about interest rates, so interest rate could be fixed or variable. So those, uh, those items will be uh, listed out in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the term sheet as well. So you could have a three-year floating rate or you could have a mix of floating rate and, uh, rate and, and, and fixed or uh, all fixed. So, you know, so these are some of the uh, simple interest rate um, scenarios you would run to, but it can be more uh, complex than that. Um, and in, in, uh, in, in many cases, and you would see that more and more these days, um, the lender would want you to buy a rate cap. So think of the rate cap as an insurance to protect you from the uh, interest rate increases uh, which, which happen because of uh, some of the policy decisions that the Fed takes. Um, so when you have a rate cap agreement, um, you are able to literally uh, protect yourself from that 
uh, impact of those uh, interest rate hikes. So that's what a rate cap agreement is. And then uh, the term sheet would, in most cases, outline what kind of rate cap do you want to buy, how long is it for, what kind of strike right do you need. Uh, so those are the things that would be uh, typically included in that rate cap part of the uh, term sheet. Um, and then moving on to some of the other uh, reserves, uh, you will have some, um, some uh, indication there in the term sheet. So you will have deferred maintenance reserve. Uh, the other reserve you want to be uh, looking at is the, is the renovation reserve. Um, so depending on the uh, project, um, that apartment may have a, you know, 100 units that need to be renovated, maybe 50 units. Um, so depending on what that is, there will be a, a, a renovation reserve that is set aside just to do the renovations. Um, so there will be uh, terms around the renovation reserve. Um, how much uh, of a renovation reserve are you getting? Is there anything that is being paid up front at closing? Um, and uh, are you being charged interest on the reserves uh, until you draw? Um, and, and so there are so many of those nuances around the renovation reserve and, and some of that language uh, will be available in the term sheet. Um, so then there is um, other language about the replacement reserve. So basically um, you would dedicate uh, a certain amount um, towards a replacement reserve, um, which is for, you know, on, on your regular, uh, on a regular usage of apartment, you'll be, uh, there'll be wear and tear. You'll be replacing uh, refrigerators and um, HVACs and, and such items which are um, considered replacement. And um, so there will be a replacement reserve uh, that is set aside with every mortgage payment. And, um, and that actually will be uh, refunded to you uh, over, um, over three to six months or depending on a certain uh, limit that you uh, fill the uh, replacement reserve with. So, so, so those terms around how, you, how much replacement reserve is needed uh, will, be, um, or will also be uh, included in the uh, term sheet. Uh, there will be um, then more uh, documentation around the, who the guarantors are, um, whether, um, you know, how, how, much, um, how much of the equity needs to be uh, broadened by the guarantors. So there will be some language around that. Um, uh, there will be a completion guarantee that uh, uh, whatever we put, put out there in terms of the um, renovation, etc., uh, are, are being completed. So there will be um, terms around that. Um, there will be other terms around uh, environmental indemnity. Um, there will be some uh, language around uh, uh, cash management. So many lenders would have what you call a soft uh, lockbox account, uh, which basically is to say that um, the bank uh, can take control of that account. Um, so in, in, in case of a default um, and, uh, or, or in situations where um, you're not make, able to make um, uh, good with the uh, terms of, of the loan, uh, basically the lender can take on the property and the operations and then all the money will go into this uh, lockbox account. So, um, so th that account uh, will be set up and then there will be uh, terms around that. Uh, there will be language around the property management company um, and also about uh, prepayment which I think we uh, discuss a, a little bit ahead uh, yeah, yeah, along with the um, um, uh, exit fee actually. So um, along with that there is also um, tons of documentation required. Um, that loan documentation is, is, is a, a totally uh, a different uh, animal and, and needs uh, a different session altogether to deal with that. Thank you so much, Saji. We learned so much from you. I mean, who knew REITs, right? So thank you for all of your knowledge, and we really do agree, really appreciate you being with us. And everyone, we'll be right back after this commercial break.